Welcome to worship at Cardiff Canton on this uh, stormy day. Thank you, band, for that uh, introduction to our worship. There shall be showers of blessing. Send us the showers, we plead. Of course, we're not asking for the, the, the rainy sort of showers, but we're asking for God to fill our hearts with his love. And uh, he's doing that, I'm sure. But we are we're de- severely depleted this morning um, the, the, with the folk in our hall. Uh, those people who are watching online, uh, welcome. And uh, please uh, enjoy our worship together this morning. But there's going to be no singing company, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, perhaps we'll end up going home a little bit earlier if I don't talk too much. So let's see. We're <laughs> oh, wow. Right. Right. So uh, we're going to stand now and we're going to sing together our first song, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. So let's stand. We're going to sing verses 1 three and four, please. Let's uh, take our seats. There's lots for us to pray for this morning in our world. The the country of Russia is on on the border, still amassing troops outside Ukraine, and there have been little skirmishes here and there. And uh, so we, we bring that situation to God in prayer this morning. And we bring... The, the families um, of people who are known to us, who have died recently, we bring them to God in prayer just now as well. And so let's just uh, be quiet for a few moments. Father God, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you through that through whatever our circumstances through the the sunny days and through the storms in our lives you are there and Lord we pray just now for those people who are grieving who are having to come to terms with a different kind of life because they have lost their loved ones we ask that they will know your presence Perhaps they will be able to experience your presence through others and through us. We thank you, Lord, for people who have who have um, had treatment in hospital recently, 
and for the success of that treatment. We ask that you will be close to them too. And we pray for our world, Lord, the situation around Ukraine, that common sense will reign, that people will have compassion for one another, and that there may be the avoidance of war. We pray for all of our leaders, Lord, that you will give them wisdom in their dealings with one another. And Father, we ask that as we worship you this morning, that we will know your presence with us, that we will hear your voice speaking to us, not just so that we feel comfortable or enjoy a blessing, but so that we might be blessed in order to bless others, so that we can be challenged in some way, changed in some way, so that we can better do your work, better be your hands and feet in this world which you have created. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus who died for us and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. And still in a, an attitude of prayer, let's sing together that lovely refrain, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. O oh, my soul, rejoice. Listen as the band leads us in this prayer. Well, we're in the middle of our self-denial appeal at the moment. That's the time when salvationists around the world consider their giving for the work of God, the mission of God, through the Salvation Army in other countries. And so for these last few weeks, we're watching videos about some of the work of the Salvation Army in other countries. And then on the first Sunday in March, we will have our self-denial altar service where there is opportunity for each of us to make a monetary gift and lay it on our Bible, our table as well at the front of the hall. So today we're going to watch our third video and this is all about the Salvation Army's work in Indonesia. 
welcome to the third of our films for this year's Self-Denial Appeal. For this year's Self-Denial Appeal, we're looking at how the Salvation Army around the world is caring for creation and responding to climate change. Today, I'll be talking to Colonel Yusak Tampi in Indonesia. Indonesia is the fourth most populated country in the world after China, India and the USA, and it's highly vulnerable to extreme weather events such as floods and droughts, as well as sea level rise and shifts in rainfall patterns. Colonel Yusak Tampi is the territorial commander in Indonesia. Good afternoon, Colonel Tampi. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing in Indonesia at the moment? Thank you so much. Uh, also, good afternoon or morning for you there in UK. Uh, we are serving at uh, more than 300 poor and outposts. And also, uh, we run more than 100 schools, public schools in the country, uh, six uh, major hospitals and various clinics, and also children's homes and even diet homes. The Salvation Army in the territory more than 127 years uh, serving and we are grateful with uh, almost 48,000 uh, senior soldiers uh, in the in the territory so that's a little bit of the territory oh fantastic colonel the focus for our self-denial appeal here in the united kingdom and ireland territory is care for creation how is climate affecting indonesia the climate in terms of the rain season or wet season we call it here and dry season has not been stable right. often we have longer rain season and the debits of uh, rain is much more heavier compared to the previous years so that causes lots of floods and also landslides our own people lost their life lives because of this uh, disaster we have buildings uh, damaged Offices, quarters uh, damaged, and all people have uh, their property damaged. So most of our people are understanding the importance of caring for our creations. Mm. What adaptions are you making within the territory to deal with this? Have you got new projects, new programs that you're putting in place to deal with with the impacts of climate change? Yes, I think one of uh, one or a number of ways. Uh, that we have been uh, trying to do is uh, through educations on environmentally friendly farming, for example. Uh, we have been initiating uh, trainings uh, uh, through agriculture initiatives, uh, uh, informing people the importance of, uh, of uh, running their farm uh, environmentally uh, friendly. At the same time, for the urban settings, uh, I think we need to be more uh, leading our people towards uh, how to handle rubbish, for example. As the church, we need to find ways uh, to introduce how we handle or manage uh, waste or rubbish in the urban setting, so that uh, people are aware of the importance to handle plastics, for example, which uh, may damage our sea. As you know, in Indonesia, we have lots of beautiful seas, uh, seasides, beaches, but uh, there have been also news that those beaches have been damaged because of the plastics uh, uh, damaging the sea, for example. Mm. Uh, Colonel Tampi, we are, you know, we are far away from you, but we're brothers and sisters in Christ because we're part of one army. What can we be praying for for you as a territory? I would uh, suggest or ask to pray for the uh, implementation of the Vision 21-25, of which uh, uh, we are uplifting the mind theme of consecrated for mission beyond borders. Uh, meaning that we would like to make sure that consecration of people is being uh, emphasized, being thought of, uh, being a disciple seat, uh, soldier seat is being uh, part of the mind focus for the territory. 
But at the same time, we also are long to see the salvage tsunami is expanding to various islands. And uh, we are excited about it. At the same time, towards being a territory, uh, fully self-support in 25 and 2030, so that we can also be a territory that uh, is able to provide support for the other territories mm -hmm. who are probably less privileged than us. That's the sense of core that we have um, with this vision 21, 25. No, it's, it's a God-honoring vision, Colonel. Thank you for sharing it. You'll be assured of our prayers and thank you so much for your Thanks time today. Thank you. Bless you. Next week, I'll be talking to Lorraine Medina in Costa Rica. So there we go. Indonesia is currently one of the parts of the Salvation Army around the world that benefits from our giving during the self-denial appeal. But you heard the colonel there say that he's longing for the day when Indonesia can be self-sufficient and then contribute to the work of the Salvation Army in other countries. And that's what God always does. He seeks to bless us so that we can then bless others. And now we're going to hear a Bible reading, which is kind of about that. Uh, Ashley's going to, going to read for us from John's Gospel, chapter 9. John chapter 9, verse 1 to 12, uh, Jesus heals a man born blind. As he went along, he saw a, blind, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is the work of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed, and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who, are, who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Salome and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Amen. Thank you very much, Ashley. We're going to hear the rest of that uh, story later on, but now let's sing together. I am a new creation. We'll stand, please, and sing this together. Here we go.
We have no singing company because some of our young people have to travel, I think, across fields and fountains, you know, with all the wind and everything. We, did, we wanted them to stay safe, and so we have no singing company. But I'm pleased to say that we do have a young people's focus. The Ribeiros are here for us. All right. What, Joe, were you saying that they're going to sing as well? Absolutely. Oh, wow. Excellent. Oh, oh lovely. Great. And everyone else. Okay. So I'm going to focus also looking at a story from John. Jesus and the woman from Samaria. Now I had written that I need some volunteers but there aren't many here this morning, so my children are volunteered. And Tom is volunteered by his mum also. So, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was making and baptising more followers than John. The Pharisees were very strict Jews. They had very strict laws. And John was an apostle. He was the son of a man called Zebedee. The Pharisees and Jesus didn't get along, to say the least. Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard about him and his followers, so he left Judea to, to go back to Galilee. Now, to put it into perspective, this trip is about 70 miles on foot. That's like walking from here to Carmarthen or from here to Hereford. On this journey, he would pass through a country called Samaria, a place where very few Jews would go. They weren't exactly welcome there. I would imagine that it was very hot when Jesus came to a town and found a well. Jesus, if you'd like to. Tom is Jesus for this morning. <laughs> Jesus was very tired, so he sat down at the well to rest and refresh himself. It was about 12 o'clock midday, the hottest part of the day, when a lady came <laughs> with a jug to collect water from the well. Most people would collect water in the early morning or later in the evening when it wasn't as hot. Now, this lady wasn't very popular in her town because she had made a lot of mistakes in her life. So she didn't have many friends. Maybe this was why she came to the well at this time of day, so she wouldn't have to bump into people who, who didn't like her. Jesus noticed her and spoke to her asking for a drink of water. Uh, drink of water. <laughs> right, oh, hang on. The lady said to Jesus, I'm surprised you're asking me for a drink because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Remember, Jesus and the Samaritans didn't get along. The Pharisees had written into Jewish law that Jewish people couldn't speak to Samaritans, people from Samaria. Jesus spoke more with the lady and seemed to know everything about her and the mistakes that she had made in her life. He told her that if she drank from the water of life, she would never be thirsty again. Now that sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? Drinking from the water of life. What Jesus actually meant by this, he uses the, the phrase water of life in the Bible to describe taking on board the Holy Spirit. So listening to God, God's message through Jesus and the Holy Spirit and having him in our lives and that will always be enough. The lady remembered that she'd heard about the Messiah coming and Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Listen to Jesus. A bit louder, Tom. I am the Messiah. He was the Messiah. The lady was so excited that she left her jug, she left her water and she ran to tell the people in her town all about Jesus. Don't get your people from the tent. <laughs> Come back. They went back to the well when they met Jesus. They begged him to stay for longer. So he stayed for two more days and made even more followers. In this story, Jesus was really, really brave. He broke Jewish law by speaking to the Samaritan woman. This lady was a bit of an outcast and not very well liked. But Jesus took the time to speak to her. He didn't treat her differently and showed her love and kindness. We must try to be like Jesus and show kindness to others. So we learn from this that if we drink from the water of life, 
Or put simply, if we listen to the message of Jesus and accept him into our lives, we will have all we need. Now I read this Bible text over and over again. And naturally, I fell down a bit of a rabbit hole and started reading all sorts of commentary on it as well. And the song that came to my mind was the songster, the beautiful songster piece, The Well is Deep. And I require a draft of the water of life. But that's not quite one for this morning spot. So how about running over? Now, I've asked them and they don't think they know running over. But I'm sure most of us know running over. My cup is full and running over. Yes, Tom? Oh, well done. <laughs> so we'll sing that. Thank you very much, young people. That was fantastic. Uh, and I'm sure it happened just like that. It was really good, lovely. And, and now we're going to listen to the video from the Songsters. Hopefully it won't be long before the Songsters are back singing live. But uh, let's listen now to the video. Oops, sorry, I missed No, hold on. Let's have the announcements. We'll have the announcements, please. Yeah. Good morning. It's a long time since I've sung that. My cup's full and running over, I have to say. Lovely to sing that again. Well, we say a big thank you to John and Hilly for the lovely flowers at the front of our hall this morning. Now this week, um, today, there is no Sunday school. The adverse weather conditions are keeping our young people away, so there's no Sunday school after the meeting this morning. Tomorrow, weather permitting, there will be home league in this hall at 1.45pm. And next Sunday, we will again gather here for worship at 10am, and our leader will be Major David. A couple of dates for your diary. Uh, as, a, as, as has already been mentioned, on the 6th of March will be our self-denial altar service here in the hall. And then on the 27th of March is our YP annual. Um, in core family news, um, core treasurer Gail Price had surgery this week, and I'm very pleased to say that it was successful. Um, and although she's still in hospital, uh, she's making good progress. So we continue to think of Gail and Barry and Stephanie at this time. Uh, I announced last week that Major Margaret Batts had been readmitted to hospital. I've had a, a message this morning to say that actually she's very gravely ill at the moment. So uh, we will keep her in our prayers along with Major Reg um, and the rest of the family. Uh, and there has been uh, very sad news this week in the wider Salvation Army uh, family. Um, the sudden promotion to glory of Major Paul Johnson. Many of us will, will remember Major Paul. Um, when they were divisional officers and, worsh and worshipped here, and Paul was a member of the band. So we do remember uh, Major Julie and the rest of the family at this time. And, and then again the news just recently that uh, Major Neville Andrew, the commanding officer at uh, Morriston Corps, suddenly promoted to glory. So we remember Major Yvonne Andrew at this time, and of course the rest of that family, and of course Morriston Corps as well, who will, will no doubt be reeling from their CEO's sudden promotion to glory. Thank you for your attention this morning. Oh. Yes, we were going to, yeah, we're going to have the Songsters video now, and then after that, I'll read the Bible, and then we will sing Out of My Darkness. I'm just changing things around a bit, so <laughs> thank you.
Thank you, songsters, for that uh, lovely song. A song in keeping, really, with the whole theme of John's Gospel. We've heard uh, from Ashley the story about the blind man receiving his sight back. We've heard from the young people the story about the woman <coughs> at the well. <coughs> Both instances of God seeking after people and finding them. Well, that story about the blind man continues. He's been healed, but the rest of John chapter 19 continues with the kind of the repercussions of that healing. So I'm going to read some more of that now. <clears throat> I won't read the whole of the chapter. If you want to read the last bit yourself, you can do that afterwards maybe at home. But here we go with John chapter 9, starting at verse 13. <clears throat> They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees who asked him how he had received his sight. Sorry, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Amen. Let's sing again. The band is going to accompany us with this lovely song, Out of my darkness God called me, out of the depth of my night. We'll stand please and sing all the verses. They're very short. Hopefully, band, you can manage four of these. <laughs> I hadn't realised that they were four verses, but they're very short. So uh, let's stand as we sing, please.
let's take our seats. There are other stories in the Gospels about blind men being healed, but this is the only one that tells of somebody who was blind from birth. And this is the only one that goes into so much detail about the immediate ripples through the blind man's community as people get to hear the good news about what had happened to him. This is more than just a report about a miraculous healing. It is a comedy of errors as everyone gets their wires crossed. It is a study in overconfidence as the ones who think they know really know nothing. It is a story about human flourishing as the healed blind man gradually finds his voice and becomes increasingly articulate and assertive. And it is a challenge for us to put our trust in Jesus so that like this man, we too can flourish and become everything he has planned for us to be. Our blind man comes into the story as a virtual non-entity, no name, no identity, no characteristics are given to us except the bare fact of what he lacked. He lacked sight. I'm reminded of a Radio 4 programme that explored issues surrounding disability called Does He Take Sugar? Does anyone remember listening to that? I looked it up on the internet and I discovered that it was last recorded in 1998, 24 years ago. Does He Take Sugar? And of course the title of the programme is kind of uh, an ironic reminder of the way that sometimes disabled people are treated by society, even polite society. We see someone in a wheelchair and rather than talk to them, we talk about them as if they're not there. At the beginning of John chapter 9, it seems like everyone else speaks for the blind man, almost as if he's not there. I expect that things had always been this way for him, having been born blind. And the Gospel writer wants to emphasise this blind man's nothingness or nobodiness. Because initially, the blind man does nothing and says nothing. He doesn't even ask to be healed in the way that the Gospel of John tells the story. But the disciples use him too, like a prop, as an opportunity for theological debate. They see the man sitting there and they ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And even Jesus, by his answer, sort of indicates that up to this point, the man is just an object, born blind not because of his parents' sin, not because he deserved it. He was born blind so that God could use him as an object lesson, so that through him, God's works might be revealed. It's almost as if he doesn't exist, at least as a person, in his own right. Yet... I am the light of the world, Jesus declares. And then, as if he were God creating man out of clay, he made some mud out of the dust on the ground and some of his saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go wash in the pool of Siloam, Jesus said to him. That's the first time in our story that the man has been treated as more than merely an object. Jesus spoke to him like he was a real person. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And it's the first time in our story that this man does something. 
he went and washed. A real person is emerging. Slowly but surely, a nobody is becoming a somebody. And it all began with Jesus' act of creation as he made something out of the dust in the ground. Even before the man washed and received his sight, he went where he was sent, to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And in going to that pool, the work of Jesus in this man's life began. Here, as this man's life begins to flourish, was a little bit of the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. Here, as this man slowly begins to realise all the potential which, he had pre which had previously been locked up in him, here was just a little bit of the new creation which Jesus brings. And what a commotion it caused. This blind man had lived in darkness his entire life but when Jesus healed him, people noticed. Maybe he was walking around pointing at things. Look, that's a tree. That's the sky. That's a donkey. Whatever it was he was doing, people noticed something different about this man who used to be blind. Was he really the same bloke that they had tolerated begging every day? Some thought he was. Others disagreed. He couldn't possibly be. So the ex-blind man spoke up for himself. I am the man, were his first words in the story. I am the man. This ex-blind man who used to sit in the corner begging had said something. I am the man. No longer could he be ignored as a non-entity. Now he had ideas of his own. Like Adam, he was a real person. Somebody that everybody else would have to reckon with. Okay, so how did it happen? How come you can now see? It turns out that even if he had at first seemed like nobody to everybody, even if he might as well have not been born. Even so, he had been taking it all in. He knew who healed him. It was the man they called Jesus, he said. He made some mud, put it on my eyes, and sent me to wash in the pool. So I did. I went where I was sent, to Siloam, which means sent, actually, and then I could see. This nobody is fast becoming a somebody. Each time he speaks more articulately than the time before. All around him is commotion and confusion. But he knows what happened. And he is sticking to his story. So where is this Jesus? Hey, wait a minute. Where is Jesus? In this gospel, which is supposed to be about Jesus... Jesus isn't around. The last we heard from Jesus was in verse 5 when he made the mud or clay and then sent the blind man to the pool. And then for the next 28 verses, Jesus is not around. 28 verses in a gospel which is supposed to be all about Jesus. But his work, his act of new creation continues to flourish as this ex-blind man becomes increasingly animated. It's almost as if the ex-blind man is continuing the work which Jesus began in him. Do you remember a few weeks ago I mentioned the manifesto or mission statement of Jesus that time when he stood up in the synagogue and read from the scroll of Isaiah. This is what he read, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim 
freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. God had anointed him to proclaim the good news. The thing about good news is that it announces something that is really happening. Good news can never just be words. If, if it is, if, it sound, if all you hear is words, then what you're listening to, listening to is merely a good idea or an interesting idea. But when people proclaim good news, they're talking about things which are really happening. Good news for the poor is an end to poverty. Good news for the hungry is food. Good news for the oppressed is freedom from oppression. Good news for the sick is healing. Jesus didn't just talk about these things. The word who became flesh turned his words into action. And now in John's Gospel, with Jesus absent from the scene for 28 verses, we see the power of his words walking and talking and flourishing in the form of this ex-blind man who is beginning to look like the only person in the neighbourhood who isn't confused. And then the Pharisees get involved. Here was a man who had been born blind, now seeing. Here was a nobody, some, suddenly becoming a somebody. But the Pharisees weren't interested in any of that. What really mattered, they thought, was whether or not Jesus might have broken any rules. Nobody was supposed to work on the Sabbath. They disagreed with each other. Was Jesus from God or wasn't he? Oh, let's ask the blind man what he thinks. This ex-blind man is quickly flourishing, moving from being a non-entity to becoming an arbiter in debates between the religious know-it-alls. He is a prophet, the blind man declares. But that's not what the Pharisees wanted to hear. The ex-blind man's parents were non-committal. He is our son, but let him speak for himself, they say. They were covering their backs, wanting to avoid get, getting banned from the fellowship. In this story, it seems that everybody except the blind man is spiritually blind. The parents don't have a clue. The Pharisees don't have a clue. His neighbours don't have a clue. Nobody has a clue. They're all blind and clueless, except the ex-blind man. Well, he can see clearly now. Only this ex-blind man was prepared to stick his neck out and speak the truth whatever the consequences. Only this ex-blind man in whom Jesus had begun a work of creation. We can imagine how his response might have seemed to those gathered around him, talking perfect sense in his unpolished, uneducated way. One commentator puts it like this, listen, I might have been blind, but you is deaf. Now listen, I was blind, but I met Jesus, and now I see. The debate between this ex-blind man and the Pharisees becomes increasingly heated as he becomes increasingly articulate, running rings around them. Why are you asking me all these questions? Do you want to be his disciples too? How dare you lecture us? and they threw him out. The fate his parents had managed to avoid, this man who had been recreated by Jesus suffers. All of this eloquence from a man who had been healed by Jesus, but as yet had not even seen 
Jesus. The last time he was with Jesus, he was still blind. What should we take away from this story and apply to our way of living today? There is new life in Christ. We need to know that. We need to experience that and share it like the blind man. There are plenty of reasons why we might want things to stay the same. We like perhaps maybe not being able to see clearly, but Jesus wants to give us new life and we need to receive it like the blind man. And we need to share it like the blind man, play our part in delivering on the manifesto which Christ owned when he read from Isaiah in the synagogue. Proclaim good news, not just good ideas. And there's one last lesson I draw from this passage as I read it. And it's about those mission priorities that I've shared the last few Sundays. Here they are again. God's mission for us is to share the good news, serve others without discrimination, nurture disciples of Jesus, care for creation, and seek justice and reconciliation. We believe that that is God's mission for us. Do you see how practical all those priorities are? And did I mention the pool to which Jesus sent the blind man? The pool called the pool of Siloam. And did I mention that Siloam means sent? That's what the gospel writer tells us it means. But here's the thing. Mission comes from a Latin word which also means sent. So these priorities are kind of our very own pool of Siloam to which Jesus sends us. So let us go where we're sent and see how we flourish. We're going to turn to our closing song. It's 814 in the Salvation Army songbook. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Now fulfill thy church's story. Bring her bud to glorious power glorious flower. That's what we want in our lives as individuals, but we want it corporately as well. We want God's wonderful work in us to be seen in our communities. So let us stand and sing verses 1, 3 and 4 of this song, please. final prayer. Father God, we thank you for the wonderful story we read when we turn to scripture about your goodness 
to us. Your desire to, to do the best in us and to see us flourish. And we want that, Lord, for the people around us too. And so we pray that you will use us as vessels of your grace. And so that through us, people can experience your love and your power and your glory. And we pray that you will do, us, do this in us as individuals like you did for that blind man. But you will do it in us, Lord, as a fellowship, as a body of your people too. And we pray this in the name of Jesus who died for us and who rose again. Amen.